Well, thank you all very much for coming um, here to hear my, the defense of my thesis and to support me. Um, thank you very much. Yes, I had the very good fortune of running into Phil at that uh, GSA meeting in Portland, and I had the great fortune to accompany him up to southern Alaska. Um, it was amazing, and it totally made all the subsequent lab work uh, worth it. Um, so yes, I'm going to be focusing on rock uplift at Hinchinbrook and Montague Islands in the Prince William Sound, which is southern Alaska. Um, Okay, so um, I'll take you through a quick geologic background, and, uh, and then I will talk about some research questions that I'll be addressing using low temperature thermochronometers, which is the preferred method for assessing rock uplift. Uh, I'll talk about results, and uh, hopefully I will wow you with the breadth of knowledge we can gain from thermochronometer ages. And then I'll talk a little bit about the indirect or regional scale implications we can derive from those thermochronometer ages. So the primary goal of my study was to, uh, is ultimately to assess how deformation is distributed in the upper plate, the North American plate, above the shallowly subducting Yakutat microplate. So Southern Alaskan geology is uh, characterized by large syntaxes, which are um, mountain ranges and faults that are arcuate in nature. Uh, and in this image, the faults are shown here as the curved red lines. That's the arcuate nature I'm talking about. Um, and Southern Alaska, the tectonics there are largely influenced by the shallow subduction of the Yakutat microplate, um, which is a buoyant semi-continental um, piece of crust um, that has been translated um, along with the Pacific Plate from, we think, somewhere down on the north coast near Washington or Seattle. Um, and it was trucked up some 500 kilometers or so to be subducted beneath um, North America in, in, uh, in southern Alaska. <coughs> so I'm going to focus in on that region. Uh, so the subducted portion of the Yakutat microplate is shown here uh, by the shaded region. Um, so that's beneath the North American plate. And uh, the leading edge of it, we think, is somewhere near the Denali Range. And um, part of why we know the extent of the Yakutat microplate is because of the cessation of magmatism or volcanism. So the volcanoes in southern Alaska are shown by these orange triangles. And um, that's because this, the Yakutat is only subducting at an angle of about six degrees. So uh, it's not steep enough to produce typical um, volcanic arc magmatism versus the Pacific slab, which is subducting at more typical angles, around 30 degrees. Um, and it's just adjacent to the Sayakatat plate. Uh, and it is responsible for the Aleutian volcanic chain and all those volcanoes that Dr. Brown is so fond of. Um, so uh, my study area, this Prince William Sound, is located in the overriding North American plate of about 25 kilometers above the interface between the Yakutat microplate and the overriding North American plate. Uh, it is about 140 kilometers north and west of the Aleutian megathrust or the convergent boundary. So several studies um, have addressed deformation associated with flat slab subduction of the Yakutat microplate uh, by looking at exhumational patterns across major fault zones in southern Alaska using low temperature thermochronometers. Uh, so these uh, contours are a compilation of apatite helium ages um, from these studies below. Um, and the cooler or the warmer colors are um, very young apatite helium ages and the warmer colors are relatively older apatite helium ages. And so what these age distributions show and what these studies have found um, is that there are regions of focused exhumation, particularly in the coastal St. Elias in the eastern Syntaxis with um, the youngest thermochronometer ages we see anywhere in Alaska. Um, generally, they're less than 2 million years old, um, which have been attributed to the coastal St. Elias' location directly within the collision front. Uh, the direct collision of the Yakutat microplate, 
uh, as well as being in the syntaxis and coupled with high glacial erosion. We see another region of focused exhumation between the border ranges and contact fault in the Shugash Mountains near Mount Marcus Baker, uh, where young ages have been attributed to underplating that's focused into the apex of the syntaxis here um, and is also coupled with glacial erosion. So the glaring question here is what's happening in this intermediate region between the active collision front uh, and the Shugash core? So um, as Phil said, we had this one preliminary outlier age on southern Montague Island with really young appetite helium age of 1.4 million years. Um, and what made that an outlier is that um, the ages found in this region of the Prince William Sound were relatively old, um, more on the order of 15 to 20 million years. Um, so that really is, is what uh, focused us in on this study area. So Hinchinbrook and Montague Islands are the largest and trenchward most islands in the Prince William Sound. They're very elongate and narrow. It's only about 20 kilometers at the, at the widest part of the islands. Um, and they're oriented perpendicular to Yakutat plate motion. Um, they are part of the Orca group, uh, which is a marine flish um, and part of a series of accretionary packages um, that were created onto southern Alaska here. The depositional age for Montague and Hinchinbrook Islands, or of the Orca Group sandstone here, uh, is about 35 million years. The Orca Group in Prince William Sound is generally separated from the Valdez Group by the contact fault, which is a large reverse fault. And throughout the talk, I will refer to the area north of the contact fault as the Shugash Mountains. I'll refer to the part, portion of the Prince William Sound been between the contact and Montague Strait Faults as central Prince William Sound. And I'll refer to southern um, Prince William Sound as the area uh, south of the Montague Strait Fault. So other um, pertinent faults that are in this region, the, the Montague Strait is a big normal fault. Um, we've just been learning. Uh, there's also the Rude River Fault which has bifurcated from the Bagley Fault farther north. It extends from Cordova down through Hinchinbrook Island. And then we have the Hanning Bay, Patton Bay, and Cape Clear Faults on southern Montague Island. They're all reverse faults that are dipping to the northwest. The Hanning Bay and Patton Bay Faults are kind of famous because they are the location of greatest surface rupture um, during the 1964 Good Friday earthquake. Um, so, on the Hanning Bay Fault, there is as much as four meters of vertical offset. Um, this is in a, the appropriately named Fault Cove on southeastern Montague Island. And then the Patton Bay Fault, uh, which is much more laterally continue, continuous, where we see, um, or there was nine meters, as much as nine meters of vertical offset um, during that 1964 earthquake. So. Uh, and, and this is a, a nice image um, taken after the earthquake of the fault scarp and subsequent landsliding. Other faults in the Prince William Sound um, were seismically imaged offshore. And the take home message with these seismic reflection profiles is that these faults are rooted at depth and that these faults are adjacent to and in some cases along strike with the faults that are on Hinchinbrook and Montague Island and that will come back later in the presentation. Uh, so other characteristics of Hinchinbrook and Montague Island, the average elevation is about 700 meters. Um, the highest peaks are no higher than 1,000 meters, uh, which is quite surprising given the, high, the steep relief. So it's, it's kind of low elevation for um, such rugged topography. Um, we also see a lot of over-steepened slopes and a lot of landsliding on the islands, and um, triangular facets on the northeastern coast that uh, sort of indicate this Patton Bay Fault might continue more north. This is a view to the north along the coast, and, and you can see how straight it is. So in general, um, all these features are pointing out a very youthful topography um, in southern Prince William Sound. So that, combined with the um, offset from the 1964 earthquake, uh, combined with the, those preliminary 
um, thermal chronometer ages led to the initial hypothesis that um, Hinchinbrook and Montague Islands are actively accommodating deformation in, um, in southern Prince William Sound and that they um, might be a narrow zone of intense deformation uh, that's resulting from the subduction of the Yakutat microplate. So, um, the, the uh, questions that I originally wanted to tackle is what is the timing of rock uplift in southern Prince William Sound? How uh, much uplift has occurred? Uh, can we discern uh, general offset across faults? And um, what is driving these rocks upward? What is the mechanism? And so I address these questions using low te temperature thermochronometers. Specifically, I employed appetite fission track and appetite uranium thorium helium um, thermochronometers. Um, and both are based on the accumulation and retention of radioactive decay products um, of the radioactive decay of uranium. So in the case of the appetite fission track system, uh, the radioactive decay product produced are fission tracks. And that occurs when the uranium atom splits in half. The two halves mutually repel each other in equal and opposite directions, which leaves behind a physical damage trail within the crystal lattice that I can then go back and actually count and measure. Um, so I, I count the number of spontaneous or natural fission tracks, and I compare that to fission tracks we induce uh, via neutron bombardment um, onto a uranium-free mica detector. So really it's the ratio of the spontaneous tracks and the induced tracks that give us the fission track age. And in the end, uh, in general, low fission track densities that I count are equivalent to young fission track ages, and high track densities are equivalent to old fission track ages. For the uranium thorium helium system, the appetite helium system, this is based on the um, accumulation and retention of helium that is again the byproduct of radioactive decay of uranium. So what I did is I um, took each sample and I extracted uh, and picked about five grains on average for each sample, packed them into platinum tubes and sent them to my friend Lindsay up at Caltech. And, uh, and she uh, analyzed the uranium, thorium, and helium content uh, within the crystal. And uh, because we know the radioactive decay coefficients for those isotopes, then I was able to turn this equation around uh, to find the helium age. So really, um, in general, more helium within a crystal is equivalent to an older age. So what is so valuable about thermochronometer <coughs> ages is that they record the time when that grain was at a specific temperature. So for the appetite helium system, for example, the closure temperature um, is the temperature at which um, if, if the grain is at cooler temperatures, temperatures cooler than 65 degrees C, helium is retained within the crystal lattice. And if uh, it is if it gets deeper in the crust or to temperatures higher than 65 de degrees C, helium is diffused out of the crystal lattice. Um, now, in reality, this occurs over a range of temperatures. So the range of temperatures from an open system to a closed system of helium retentivity is called the partial retention zone. Um, and so for the appetite fission track system, that closure temperature is 110 degrees C, so it's a bit hotter. Uh, and it deals with um, fission tracks that anneal or uh, um, heal themselves at temperatures higher than 110 degrees C. So that gives us the time when these grains were at this temperature. And if we know the local geothermal gradient and mean surface temperature, um, then we can derive a depth, an equivalent depth. So for the appetite helium system, about 65 degrees C is equivalent to about three kilometers. Um, and so when we go and we measure the age of that grain um, and we know what depth it came from, that gives us a basic rate equation, distance over time, which tells us the, the rate that, that rocks come to the surface or the rock uplift rate. And so I will be talking throughout um, the talk about uh, 
I will be using rock uplift, the term rock uplift a lot. I will also be referring to exhumation. And exhumation is that rock uplift minus uh, erosion at the surface. Okay, so with those methods in mind, I collected 32 samples of Orca Group sandstone. I tried to collect them in a spatially dispersed pattern as well as across the structural grain of the islands or across the faults. Uh, and because sampling on the islands is a bit difficult, um, the islands are really rugged, densely vegetated, and notoriously grizzly bear inhabited, uh, we got around via helicopter. Not too shabby. Uh, so this is our helicopter pilot, Eric. He saw us around safely. And then my trusty field assistant, Matan. Um, and so because they're grizzly bear populated, we took the proper precautions. And generally when we were sampling, we had someone standing guard with a gun. That was usually Phil. And uh, because you can't get in the helicopter with a loaded gun, he would have to unload it and then reload it every time we got out to stand guard. So you can imagine how redundant that probably got for him when we sampled at 20 plus locations. Uh, and after all that, we never saw a grizzly bear on the islands. Uh, we did see evidence of them later on, and I did see one from a distance on the Copper River later, so that was good enough for me. <laughs> but as you can see, uh, we sampled um, at sea level, so along the coast, and we also sampled at um, the highest peaks to kind of um, capture the ages as they spanned uh, the relief. Um, and generally we were targeting medium to coarse grain sandstones um, so that the appetites we picked out were euhedral and um, hopefully not broke, too broken. So a year and a half later and hundreds of hours counting fission tracks and picking appetite grains later, these are my results. Um, so the, the um, sample boxes here, um, they're labeled as sample number at the top, ap appetite helium age and appetite fission track age. And just generally, the average appetite helium age I computed uh, was 5 million years for those samples in southern Prince William Sound. And the av average appetite fission track age is about 10 million years for the samples in southern Prince William Sound. Um, so that's really, really young. Um, and especially when compared with those samples in central Prince William Sound, um, two of which I, uh, I sampled, um, they had ages more on the order of 13 to 25 million years. So um, much older. Okay, looking at the appetite helium data more specifically, uh, we had generally three populations of ages. Uh, we had a population of really young ages, less than two million years on south uh, western Montague Island. A uh, second population of ages um, that included so southeastern Montague, uh, northern Montague, and Hinchinbrook Islands, um, generally consistently between three and six million years. And then we had a third population of ages north of the Montague Strait Fault, much older at seven to 11 million years. For the appetite fission track data, we saw a similar uh, pattern. Younger ages on southwestern Montague between 4.5 and 7.5 million years. Um, from southeastern, northern uh, Montague and Hinchinbrook, a second population of ages between 8 and 12 million years. And older ages near the Montague Strait Fault between 15 and 20 million years. Okay, so that's kind of the general pattern of ages. And then I looked at um, ages as, as they... Um, varied across faults on southern Montague Island. So this transect is shown here. Uh, and so these plots, uh, transect A to A prime across Montague, it um, goes from uh, west to east down here. It's, it encompasses about 80 kilometers. I have the ages plotted on the lower plot and the exhumation rates plotted on the upper plot. So these exhumation rates were computed based on assumptions of a constant geothermal gradient. And they've also been corrected for thermal advection of, um, uh, so when the samples come to the surface, they um, bring heat with them and it kind of bows the geotherms up. So these exhumation rates have been corrected for that. And I have plotted the samples in relation to the faults. So I have the Montague Strait, Hanning Bay, Patton Bay, and Cape Clear Fault. 
uh, and really uh, the take home message here is, so we see those older ages north of the Montague Strait Fault with relatively low exhumation rates. We have the really young ages on the hanging wall of the Patton Bay Fault in particular. Um, you know, two, less than two million years for the Aptite Helium system, around five or six million years for the Aptite Fission Track system. Uh, and the highest exhumation rates of anywhere in southern Prince William Sound are found on this Patton Bay block on southern Montague, uh, with exhumation rates as high as 2.4 kilometers per million year. As we move to the uh, f uh, hanging wall block of the Cape Clear Fault, uh, ages get older, exhumation rates get lower. Um, and then uh, on the foot wall block of the Cape Clear Fault, we have the oldest ages for southern Montague Island, around 6 million years for the Aptite Helium system, 15 million years for the Aptite Fission Track system, and the lowest exhumation rates on this fault block as well. Okay, so. Uh, trying to discern similar patterns up on Hinchinbrook Island. So um, here we have the Montague Strait Fault and the Rude River Fault, which comes down here. Uh, and so again, older ages north of the Montague Strait Fault. The Aptite helium ages are relatively invariant. They are very consistently around 5 million years, even across um, the faults on Hinchinbrook <coughs> Island. The Aptite fission track ages uh, are, they, they get a little bit younger as we go east of the Rude River Fault, about five million years younger. Uh, so we see some variation across that Rude River Fault. And exhumation rates are pretty consistent, 0.4 and about 0.5 kilometers per million year. So then looking at the ages in a longitudinal profile that's um, uh, parallel to the strike of the faults, um, so the patterns we see as we go from the northwest to the southeast, we see Apatite helium ages younging. Okay, so they get their oldest near the Cordova region and their youngest in southern Montague Island. The Apatite fission track ages are relatively invariant. They show a slight decrease from north to south. Um, the exhumation rates, the Apatite fission track exhumation rates stay largely the same. The Aptite helium exhumation rates increase uh, by quite a lot as we go south along this profile. So what this indicates is that uh, exhumation rates have been relatively constant up until those samples pass through Aptite helium closure temperatures. Um, and so since uh, Aptite helium closure, or since the last about five million years, we've seen an increase in exhumation rate. So that's what this plot is telling us here. And um, you can see that by where the exhumation rate, appetite helium exhumation rate diverges from the appetite fission track one. All right, so that's sort of the patterns uh, specific to Southern Montague Island. Uh, I'm gonna put that in the regional context. So in this transect that crosses the apex of the syntaxis um, up through all the way to the Talkeetna Mountains, this figure is modified from Arkel et al. And um, so I have the transect from southeast to northwest uh, on the x-axis and on the y-axis thermochronometer ages here. And these trend lines, the blue trend line is for appetite helium ages, the red for appetite fission track ages, and the yellow for zircon fission track ages. And so we see this general pattern. Oh, and the, the samples are plotted relative to the faults. So we have the Border Ranges Fault, Contact Fault, Montague Strait Fault. Um, so generally we see much older ages in the Talkeetna Mountains, uh, much younger ages than as we cross over into the core of the Shugash Mountains. Older ages again in that central Prince William Sound area and in southern Prince William Sound or my study area, um, ages decrease by quite a lot. There is a diversion here, however, between the Apatite helium and Apatite fission track system and the zircon fission track system. And this has to do with the fact that the Apatite helium and Apatite fission track um, thermochronometers are reset with respect to their depositional age, whereas the zircon fission track ones are not. And I'm going to talk about that a bit later. But this is the kind of general regional trend. All right, so I've talked about kind of the timing of rock uplift 
Um, and now I want to talk about cooling rates or the paths that those samples took um, coming to the surface. So I've plotted all of my samples um, here uh, with closure temperature on the, on the y-axis and their age, their thermochronometer age on the x-axis. And so um, these cooling rate paths were coming to the surface. So as you can see, the appetite helium closure temperature was on average about 70 degrees C. And we assumed an appetite fission track closure temperature of 110 degrees C. Um, the average appetite helium age is less than 5 million years, and the appetite fission track age was on the average 10 to 12 million years. So this bolded line shows the average cooling rate for all the samples in southern Prince William Sound. And um, the take home message with this, and what I want to draw your attention to is this break in slope around uh, when the rocks were passing through appetite helium closure temperatures. <coughs> And so what that tells us is that they were um, coming up at a slower rate prior to passing through the appetite closure temperature, and then that cooling rate increased since passing through the appetite helium closure temperature, or since 5 million years, which is pretty much consistent with all of the thermochronometers in southern Alaska that exhumation and cooling rates have increased in the last 5 million years. This green shaded region um, it's the general constraints that we've put on the potential zircon fission track cooling paths. Now, if you remember my little sketch from before, we had appetite helium and appetite fission track closure temperatures. Uh, the zircon fission track uh, is representative of a higher temperature thermochronometer. So its closure temperature is more like 130 degrees C, or excuse me, 230 degrees C. Um, so the constraints I've put here are based on the depositional age uh, of the orca group in southern Prince William Sound, which is 35 million years, which means that those rocks had to have been at the surface or at um, surface temperatures just after 35 million years, or their depositional age. And um, the zircon fission track ages um, could, uh, that were around 50 million years, um, were unreset. So that means that they're older than the depositional age. So that means that they could not, the, the zircon fission tracks could not, or samples, could not have um, been buried to temperatures hotter than two, about 200 degrees C. Um, but we know that they had to have been buried to depths hotter than 120 degrees C because the appetite fission track ages are reset. So that puts these general constraints on how deep those rocks had to have been buried. Um, it also allows us to put um, constraints on how much the maximum uplift had to have been in southern Prince William Sound. So if they were buried to max temperatures of 200 degrees C, and we assume an, a geothermal gradient of um, on average 25 degrees C per kilometers, uh, that means that a maximum uplift amount uh, is about eight kilometers for southern Prince William Sound. So that's really cool that we can place those constraints. We can also constrain the timing of apparent uplift in southern Prince William Sound. Um, so we know that these rocks were buried um, to temperatures and corresponding depths with the zircon fission track system. Um, uh, but then they, they started to be uplifted, right, because we have um, because they were cooling to the surface. So that means that the timing of uplift had to have been between 35 and about 22 million years, or when those rocks were passing through appetite fission track closure temperatures. Okay, so that's really important because if we know the general onset of uplift in southern Prince William Sound, that tells us something about the onset of initiation of Yakutat subduction because that's what's driving these rocks um, to the surface, or so we think. Okay, <clears throat> so other, um, uh, other things that we can derive from these thermochronometer ages, uh, we can assess the general uplift patterns across faults. Uh, so we know that on the hanging wall block of the Patton Bay Fault, average appetite helium ages are about 1.7 million years. Uh, versus the footwall block of the Patton Bay Fault, 
where average ab titanium ages are 3.3 million years. So I've plotted the hanging wall, the average hanging wall um, ages and closure temperatures, as well as the average foot wall ages and closure temperatures into a cooling rate path the same way I did before. And if we assume that these blocks um, were cooling at a constant rate since 3.3 million years, that means I can extrapolate <coughs> this hanging wall block cooling or the appetite helium closure temperatures on the hanging wall block uh, or cooling rates, I can extract that back to 3.3 million years um, to, to compare the same time frame. And so what that gets me is a difference in closure temperature between the hanging wall block and the foot wall block of 65 degrees C. And uh, if I uh, um, use that constant average geothermal gradient, that gets me a maximum of 2.6 kilometers of differential uplift across that Patton Bay Fault. Furthermore, since I know the Patton Bay Fault is dipping at about 60 degrees, um, simple geometry gets me about three kilometers of um, differential offset along that fault plane, which it might be more because um, this fault dip might be shallower. Um, so this is really cool that we can constrain differential offset along fault blocks just from the thermochronometer ages. We can play the same game for other samples on northern Montague and Hinchinbrook Islands. So the difference here is that um, faults are, are just mapped as lineaments, but they're clearly expressed in the topography. For example, here at Zykoff Bay and Rocky Bay, um, we have these clear fault blocks that are expressed in the topography. However, especially in the aptite helium system, the thermochronometer ages are very consistent, all around 5 million years, and here on Montague Island, they're all around 4.5 million years. So um, how do you get thermochronometers uh, ages that are adjacent to one another on adjacent fault blocks where we know there's been offset because it's expressed in the topography, but the ages are the same? Um, so knowing that, just based on that simple observation, uh, we can make estimates on the maximum amount of slip possible on those faults. So. Um, if this is uh, one of those faults, one of those geomorphically constrained faults, and in general the, the orange material here is older ages and the green material here is younger ages, and we have this 40 degrees C isotherm, or the top of the partial retention zone for the aptite helium system. Um, we can um, compute that the maximum amount of offsets uh, had to have been 1.6 kilometers because if it was any more than that then we would expose those older ages adjacent to younger ages at the surface. All right, so that's a pretty cool constraint. Um, and this also assumes that um, uh, we ha this 1.6 kilometers occurred since the last 4.5 million years. So it also assumes that those rocks were kind of hanging out at this 40 degree isotherm around um, 4.5 million years. Okay, and so that was a hypothetical example for one of these faults crossing um, either at Rocky or Zykoff Bay. All right, so, um, so far I've been able to determine the age patterns uh, for Southern and Prince William Sound since passing through aptite helium and aptite fission at closure temperatures. I've been able to discern the timing of rock uplift, so it had to have initiated between um, less than 35 and 22 million years. I've been able to compute the exhumation rates, some of which are as high as 2.5 millimeters a year. Um, and I've been able to, to, to discern that exhumation and cooling rates have increased in the last five million years. I've been able to determine the maximum amount of exhumation of eight kilometers and maximum offset across faults, just based on the thermochronometer ages. That's cool. But what is driving these rocks to the surface? That's still the ultimate question. Uh, so, so based on everything that I've, I've been able to determine using the thermochronometer ages, my interpretation is that 
rocks in the southern Prince William Sound are making their way to the surface via thin fault slivers um, that are rooted at depth and that um, the plate interface they're rooted to uh, is the mega thrust. Okay, so I've interpreted these as mega thrust splay faults. So this is my kind of schematic interpretation of what this cross section would look like from Latouche Island down over all the way over to the Aleutian Trench. So um, I've put here all the faults in place for you, Montague, Hanning Bay, Patton Bay, and the Cape Clear Fault. Um, and so and I've shown the plate interface, the mega thrust interface interface with those splays coming up. Um, and so this schematic interpretation is based in part from Heusler et al. 2011, but it's also inspired by those seismic reflection profiles showing those faults rooted at depth, as well as the general geometry of what we see in splay faults elsewhere in the world. Um, so really what I wanted to show you with this schematic interpretation is um, I've plotted the exhumation rates above relative to the faults um, just to reiterate that exhumation rates are really high from one fault block um, versus another. And um, for that to occur over such a, a narrow um, region really is indicative of these splay faults um, that may or may not have a duplex geometry. There may also be some degree of underplating that's kind of feeding these faults and driving um, those rocks up to the surface. All right, so. Putting this all in the regional context, we have our focus, regions of focused exhumation in the Shugash core and um, the coastal St. Elias, um, and then my interpretation of mega thrust splay faulting in the Prince William Sound, where um, ages are equally as young as these regions of focused exhumation. And so initially, um, Spotilla and Berger et al. Uh, postulated that this zone of rapid exhumation in the coastal St. Elias um, bends south at the Miles Corner to connect with the Kayak Island Zone and the um, Aleutian Megathrust. But I think um, an, an additional interpretation could be that these, this zone of rapid exhumation is actually transferred uh, across the Copper River Delta into the southern Prince William Sound based on the similarity in ages. Um, in which case, these, um, this, this region of focused exhumation might be concentrated along this Shugash St. Elias Fault backstop, uh, in which case the Montague Strait Fault might also represent a sort of structural backstop to, um, to rapid uplift. An additional hypothesis or uh, interpretation, I should say, of this data is that um, the central Prince or the southern Prince William Sound is part of a broader region of deformation um, that extends from the from the St. Elias in the east all the way over into the Prince William Sound and perhaps includes this region I've drawn in orange. Um, th this very well may be the case especially given that um, there was surface uplift on Middleton Island uh, as well as on Hinchinbrook and Montague Islands during the 1964 earthquake, suggesting that, that these structures are all linked at depth over this broad region. Um, so this is the preferred in interpretation, my preferred interpretation, uh, based on these uplifted surfaces and sort of the similarity in ages between the southern Prince William Sound and the coastal St. Elias. Okay, we made it. So uh, my general conclusions, appetite helium and appetite fission track ages on Hinchinbrook and Montague Island and in the southern Prince William Sound are young. Um, between 1 and 6 million years for the appetite helium system and between 5 and 13 million years for the appetite fission track system. Um, I've also been able to use the thermochronometers to help constrain the timing of Yakutat subduction um, and to determine the mode of deformation which I interpret as splay faults, splay faulting off the mega thrust um, that may or may not have a duplex geometry. And then in the regional context, uh, the high rock uplift rate uh, in the St. Elias uh, origin, I think has become broadly distributed across the area and extends from the Montague and Hinchinbrook Island area region. 
um, across uh, across over to the Aleutian Mega Thrust. Okay, so that's that. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, acknowledge a few people. Um, I, I would like to thank Matan for his help in the field, being my trusty uh, field assistant. I'd like to give a quick shout out to Peter and Katie Heusler, who, uh, who gave us a place to stay for a couple nights while we were doing field work up there. Um, I would like to thank all my family and friends who are here and who have supported me along the way, especially my husband, Nate, uh, who is my much needed comedic relief when I come home at night. So I love you. And uh, I'd like to thank my committee members, um, Dr. Brady Rose, Dr. Dave Bowman, and Dr. Peter Heusler, who you've all made yourselves available to my question, uh, to all my questions. I have lots of questions always. So making yourselves available to me and for being on my committee, thank you. And um, last but not least, Dr. Armstrong, Phil. Um, gosh, such a multifaceted thank you. But I would really just like to thank you for this opportunity. I'd like to thank you for your patience with me. <laughs> um, you've not only given me this amazing um, research project, but, but also helped me um, see a research project through um, successfully and writing a big paper successfully. Uh, and um, so not so, so I wanted to thank you not just for, for the, you know, academic part of that, but also the lessons along the way, you know, finding a balance between work and play, um, learning how to fly a tippet on the end of the fly rod, um, <laughs> just the fun stuff along the way. Uh, anyway, I could not have asked for more from a research advisor, and I'm eternally grateful to you. So thank you, Phil. And thank you all for being here. Oh, I had to <laughs> <laughs> I forgot I did that. So thank you. I'll take questions.